I'm going to sing to you a little song called Go Down Worthy, which is one of my favorite songs of all. It's quite appropriate for what I'm going to preach about. So. <laughs> When Israel, <coughs> can I get the right tone? Huh? Israel, when Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go. They pressed so hard they could not stand. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way. Let my, let my people go. The Lord told Moses what to do. Let my people go to lead the Hebrew children through. Let my people go. Way down in Egypt land, tell old let my, let my people go. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, I was really, I must say the word, shocked to see how beautiful the place is becoming. It's just amazing. Uh, congratulations to all of you for the great work you're doing at, at Riverway. You know, when Ben uh, contacted me this week and, and asked me for my uh, sermon title and, uh, you know, hymn number and so on, oh, I was expecting, uh, you know who I was expecting, yeah, Pam Lewis to write to me. That's life. She's a warrior. Her influence carries on just like Ray Cree and many others who've been in this church. And I see the young ones are growing up like Laura, and I can't believe my eyes when he stands here. He's like a young man ready to drive. Do you drive already, Lauren? Lance, I meant. I, I don't know what. Forgive me, I thought Lauren doesn't sound right. Lauren, and he's a young man. I thought maybe it's a new thing like Polo Lauren or some. You know, I forget. You know, I'm terrible memory. Lance, Lance, do you drive? No, but he's so tall, isn't he? Everybody's grown up so much. Anyway, it's lovely to be here among you, and as always, cosmopolitan, so many different nationalities, fantastic. This morning, I'm not going to take very long. I'm just going to uh, reaffirm for us that God is in control in spite of everything that's going on, and God has appointed time for everything. In his time, he does everything. Like Jesus in Luke chapter 4 that was a Bible study, by the way. You know, he gave a Bible study to Cleopas on the road to Emmaus. Wonderful Bible study going through the books of Moses, all the way down to Zechariah, saying, look, this is talking about me, talking about me, talking about me, talking about me. And then now he stands in the temple and says, this is talking about me. You know, Isaiah 61 being quoted there in Luke chapter 4. And um, interesting, when he stands there in the synagogue, he was following a custom that the Jews had, whereby every three to five years, it would take that long, they would read through the Old Testament every Sabbath in the synagogue. They would read a portion of, well, not, not uh, you know, like this, it'd be a scroll. They must have had a bookmark to, to see where they reached. So the next Sabbath, whoever was going to read, they open the scroll to where they reach and they carry on until they finish the whole Old Testament in about three to five years. That was a custom. So when Jesus came to the synagogue and... Uh, they gave him the, the scroll, and he opened it, and he found, he must have gone to the place where they said, this is where you have to read. I find that interesting, that on the day that he's reading, he reads the thing that's about him, Isaiah 61, the Lord has proclaimed me to, you know, and, and all the rest of it. So that's in, in, in interesting. In the Bible, there are many references to God doing things in his own time, which, of course, don't always marry up with our own intentions. We want things to be done in our time. Isn't that right? Like Abraham wanted, or Sarah especially, but he too, they wanted to have a child, you know, 
in their own time, and they went ahead and did all sorts of subterfuge to try and make that happen. Uh, Saul, when he was waiting for Samuel, and Samuel didn't turn up, he started offering sacrifices in his time rather than the, in the appointed time. You know, there's a time for everything Ecclesiastes tells us. And if you look at Exodus, now the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham and his son Isaac, and then Jacob, and Jacob had the, the 12 future patriarchs, his 12 sons, and they went into Egypt. They were already there in the, in the promised land, if you like, but they hadn't occupied it yet. They were there for 430 years, which is a long time. It's almost as if God is saying, okay, let Satan have his little go first. Give him as long as possible, 400 plus years, you know, four centuries. Go on, Satan, do what you can, you know. And uh, then God says to Moses, I've heard the cry of the children of Israel. The time is right now. And it said in Exodus chapter 12, verses 40, 41, and 51, on the self-same day, like the, the very day that God had appointed, it says they're going to come out then. They're going to come out. And um, God does not just control the historical events and has a timetable, but he even controls things before they even happen in terms of like birth, before you're even born. God is actually planning things. If you look at Jeremiah, for example, I, I, I never used to like the book Jeremiah for some reason. I always associated it with lamentations and I thought, you know, it like, sounds a bit sad, you know. So my favorite book was always Isaiah, but the last few years I've, I've come to love this book so much. It's not at all sad. It's extremely, extremely beautiful. And you think of Jeremiah 29, 11, for one of the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And so many of the beautiful texts. But when Jeremiah was called by God, he was a bit like Moses, you know, when Moses had been in the wilderness for so long and had lost the use of uh, the Egyptian language and um, felt very inadequate. He said, I can't speak. I can't go back there. So Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to me. That's Jeremiah 1 verse 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Isn't that amazing, Lance? Isn't that amazing, Jody, everybody? Before, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And I don't think this is just for Jeremiah, by the way. I don't think God plays favorites. I think this is for every single person on this planet, whether they're a Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, whatever. God has a plan for their life, and God will unfold it. He says, I appointed you. As a prophet to the nations, look at the response of Jeremiah. He can't believe what he's hearing. It's in verse 6. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. This is a grown man saying, I'm only a child. He's like, I feel so incompetent, inadequate to do this. You know, people who've been asked this morning to be on the nominating committee, God's calling is his enabling, isn't it? So you prepare to do something even though you say, okay, I'm not really sure I can do this. And then God said to him, Do not say I'm only a child, verse 7. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Don't be afraid. I am with you. Isn't that lovely? So God has a plan even before we we are born. You look at Psalm 139, uh, which I'm sure many of you know very well. Uh, It's that famous psalm uh, which talks about the fact that it talks about many things. It's, it's, It's a little jewel in the middle of the book of Psalms. It talks about many, many things. Uh, such as the the end of it, like, search me, O God, and know my heart. You know that one, yeah? Um, Test my thoughts and so on. But uh, the bit I want to look at, really, is is in the middle. Verse 13 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. They didn't have this sort of facility, like, to go to the radiographer and have a look at the baby being born in those days. But God could see. God could see. He says, You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully... And wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden for you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together. Look where where it says. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Remember we were born. We were first created through the soil. God took the soil and made Adam. So in a sense we're all descendants of that. And God said before you even. When you were just in the soil. You know. Uh, one thing as, as a gardener, as a keen gardener, I notice is I'm, I'm amazed because, you know, you'll, you'll put a little seed in the garden. 
you know, and it could be a vegetable, like uh, say Swiss chard, which is one of my favorite vegetables. You know what Swiss chard is, anybody? Yeah? yeah, exactly. It's beautiful, you've got it in green and red colors. And it grows and it becomes tall and I chop it and I put it in my food, you know. And the next day I come and I chop it, I put it in my food. I'm eating earth, I'm eating dirt because, you know, the only thing that was, was a tiny seed. Where does the rest of it come from? Where do those beautiful green leaves come from? From the dirt. You know? And, and that dirt goes inside me and feeds me. So I'm really made of dust, of nothing, you know? But God does this miracle for us. And, um, you know, uh, apart from God having a plan and a time and a kind of events, he, another thing he does as well with regards to his control of everything is he makes sure that we understand that even though he went to Abraham and made a covenant with him, you know, that the whole world will be blessed by you. And he goes to Noah before then, makes a covenant. You know, I will never destroy the earth by water again. So it's a various covenants. And God includes everybody, whether it's a Muslim, a Buddhist, an immigrant, whoever, whoever. All children of the earth are created in God's image. Yeah? So everybody who wants to know him, I'm not saying by this that, you know, every, every way is true, every religious way is true, but God has a love for humanity. And uh, he, in, in Acts chapter 10, verses 34, 35, we have this, this episode where Peter is like being very exclusive, and he had a hard time of letting go of his insularity, his idea that, you know, we Jews, us Jews, you know, were the chosen people. The Gentiles can't really eat in the same house as them because then we'd be contaminated, you know. And there was this sort of exclusive idea, this sort of superiority, you know, complex among some of the people in, the, in those days towards the Gentiles, which God wanted, God wanted to break that barrier. Yes, God had a people who was to do a work for him, but God did not want to restrict salvation just to them. So in Acts 10, verses 34, 35, we read there that God is no respecter of persons. In other words, it doesn't mean God doesn't respect people. It just means like, it doesn't matter whether you're a king or a beggar or whether you're, you know, from this camp or that camp. You know, I love everybody, God says, because they're all my children. I love Nebuchadnezzar. I love, you know, all people of the world. And if you look at, at, at the Bible and, and genders as well, you know, uh, I'm going to explain a word to some of you who don't understand this word. It's called Christophany. C-H-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-N-Y. Basically, it means like an appearance of Jesus in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, because, you know, when sin occurred, we could not see God face to face, right? We had to always sort of go through a, uh, an intermediary. Either the priest talked to God and the priest talks to us in the Old Testament. But from time to time, Jesus would come down to earth and talk to people, but he would do it in a way that he took the appearance of an angel. Yeah, an angel. But then as you read, wherever Jesus appears as an angel, when you read there, you find it's not just an angel. Because the person speaking to the angel, you know, addresses the angel as God. So you can see it's called Christophany. Now, the very first Christophany in the Bible, in the Old Testament, happened to a pagan woman. Isn't that interesting? And especially given that women in the ancient Near East in those days didn't have a very high status. Yeah, they had a second class status. So you read that in Genesis 16, verse 7, and verses 13 to 14, where Hagar is basically despairing as to what she will do, because in those days, if you didn't have a man to look after you and provide for your financial well being and security for you to protect you from attacks from people outside, then you were very, very vulnerable. But uh, Hagar was there crying her eyes out with her little boy, you know, Ishmael, not knowing what to do. And then Jesus appears to her and says beautiful things to her. So that's the first Christopher to a, a, a pagan woman. And the first person that Jesus reveals himself to when he was on earth as the Messiah, because he didn't want to do that to everybody, because many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, if they heard something of like that from him, they would twist his words and say, look, he's mad, he's saying he's God, and so on. I mean, he proved he was God by the miracles he made. But if you were to say it, they would use those words and twist them and cause problems, which is why sometimes Jesus said to people, don't tell anybody I've been here. 
purpose. Keep it to yourself. He had to walk very circumspectly and, and, and you know, get his mission done. But the very first person that Jesus openly said to that I am the Messiah was a, a pagan woman. Again, at the well, the woman at the well in um, John 4, verses 25, 26, we find that Jesus says, I speaking to you am he. Isn't that beautiful? And uh, the first person to see Jesus after he's resurrected, again, another woman. I find that interesting. So almost as if God is saying, look, Eve has fallen, but don't blame all women because of that. You know, I give a special status and appreciation for women. And so at the tomb, Mary Magdalene, who was a woman of very ill repute in the past, had been possessed by demons because of what she was doing. She was a prostitute. And, uh, but she repented and, and gave her heart to Jesus. But the very first person to see Jesus, that Jesus allows to see him, is that very same Mary Magdalene. You can read that in John 20, verses 16 to 18. And then the greatest, the longest time prophecy in the Bible, which starts with Babylon, goes right through to when Jesus comes back, you know, through Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and the divided kingdoms at the end. Greatest time prophecy, longest, most beautiful, exclusive prophecy given in vision to a man of God, a priest. Is that right? No. Given to a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. He's the one who received that vision. And you can read that in Daniel 2, verses 1 to 2 and 28. And Daniel does say to him, when Daniel finds out what the vision is, and when it's all about it, he says, oh, the great God has revealed to you your majesty. That's a great honor, isn't it? You know, to be given a dream or a vision like that of world prophecy to end, to the end of time. So uh, if you have time today, take the book Desire of Ages. If you don't have it, get it online and read chapter 3 called In the Fullness of Time. And there's a quote I would like to just quote now from there. It says, but like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste. And no delay. Isn't that beautiful? That God has a plan and it will happen. It's not like us human beings on this planet. We have plans and we try to implement them where we get problems on this side and that side and things just don't go to plan. But God said, no, when he has decided, it might take a long time, the arc of the travel, the journey, the trajectory, but when it has reached its point of occurrence, it will occur. Uh, in Acts 17.31, we're told God has set a time to judge the earth. You know, we've all got diaries. We write in there, oh, Tuesday, I'm going to go to, you know, this center. Wednesday, I've had that appointment. And somebody rings us, okay, Thursday, whatever. Yeah. And then we go through the weekend. We keep checking our diary. And then we cross off. We've done that. We've done that, you know. And make sure we get there on time. Like an appointment today to go and preach. So I came to preach. You know, I left at a certain time. I had to plan it. And God says he has in his final facts, if you like, he says, God has set a time to judge the earth. It will happen because God has never broken his word to anyone, any time, any place. We are now living, I think you will agree with me, in the very, very toes of the statue of Daniel 2. You know, we are not in Babylon, it's gone, middle pressure is gone, Greece is gone, just like predicted. Now we're living at the very, 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 very toenail of that, we say of that statue. Because you look around, people don't know where to get solutions. You look at politics, it's like confusion. You know, when there are so many intelligent people in, in the world, super intelligent, and they're always having lectures and conferences about conflict resolution, how to succeed in life, how to communicate. You know, TED talks about how to communicate, how to bring people together. In spite of all these Amazing experts, you find people are at loggerheads day in, day out. Is that not true? There are no solutions to come from men. But because of that, it's good news in a way, because it tells us that we are very, very much in the end, because there's no solution. Romans 13, 11, written some 2,000 years ago, still very valid today, says, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. At the start of the sermon, I, I sang a song about, you know, go down Moses, and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. We have been living in, in Egypt 
all of us, which is this world, you know. Some of us come, some die, like Pam Lewis has passed away and so on. But we are living in Egypt down here. This is not where we are meant to be. We're slaves because of sin. Slave to the grind of work and oppression at work. Slave to worry about the future. How are we going to make it? There's going to be massive queues after Brexit or the opposite view. Whatever view you have on, on politics, people are worried. Very, very, very worried. Christians or non-Christians. How about exodus needs to happen. And we need to remember that God is in charge. When I was a little boy in Mauritius, in Mauritius, yeah, apart from Mesh and Ben, any other Mauritians? Oh, okay, there used to be a few more. What happened to them? Well, we lost our Mauritians. Oh, that's a shame. Anyway, when I was a little boy, we used to have a joke, which you will not find funny. I will tell you the joke. You will not find it funny. It's not funny. But it was funny for us because it's a cultural thing, yeah? It was told in Creole, Mauritian Creole, which is like a sort of distant relative of French. And it went something like this. There's, there's, there's a boy and his, his older friend has got a car. They're driving along. And uh, he's showing off his new car, which can go really fast. It's okay. You ready? Say, yeah. It's 60 miles per hour. He says, are you scared? No, I'm not scared. It's 60 miles per hour. You couldn't really do this in Russia. In Russia, if you drive... If you drive 50 miles per hour, you go in the sea, so small. But let's just pretend, yeah? Suspend our judgment for a minute. Are you scared? No, no, I'm not scared. He goes at 70 miles per hour. Are you scared? No, I'm not scared. He goes, 80 miles per hour. Are you scared? In Creole, to get pair? No, more pas gain pair. No, I'm not scared. And he puts it right down, 90 miles per hour. Are you scared? Well, if I'm not scared now, when am I going to be scared? And at this point, we all burst out laughing in Mauritius, which, of course, you're like, why? Why are you laughing? It's just funny in Mauritius. I don't know why. Is it? If you don't get scared now, when are you going to get scared? It's the way the words sort of collide into each other, alliteration and everything. It just sounds funny. But the point I'm making, I think that story is, is, is relevant for us because if we don't get scared now, if we don't see how hot, how boiling the water is, when are we going to realize it? So it's time for us to be scared. To be scared that really... The time of Jacob's trouble is coming, and it's time for us to start coming closer to our Lord and Savior. Let him guide us, you know, just as Moses and Elijah came down to be with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. I stood there in the Holy Land. I'm sure some of you have when you went on that trip to the Holy Land. Very moving place to stand to realize that our Lord and Savior stood here. It's not a very big place, the top of that mountain, you know. Elijah and Moses came and comforted him before his, and the word in the Greek is his exodus or leaving planet Earth to go back up to the ascension before he had to go through the crucifixion and then the exodus. So the Holy Bible tells us that we need to also be comforted in our exodus to get ready to go back up. My prayer for you and for me.